So um, Kid Ray, how are you doing? Well, I'm happy to see you, Sam. It's been a it's long a, time. It has been a long, long time. Um, I'm here in my bunker in Los Angeles, and it's 56 degrees outside. And uh, as David Lynch, our leading meteorologist, would say, there's plenty of blue sky and golden sunshine. That's beautiful. How are you? Where are you? I'm uh, in New York City. I'm in my at my office at uh, Columbia University, and uh, I've put up a. So I share this office, so I put up a live recording "Do Not Disturb" sign on the on the outside. So I'm, I'm no, quite confident that we'll be able to get through this hour without any people from Porlock disrupting our flow. No, um, no. I don't want to lie to the people who might be watching this. I, it's been a short time since I saw you, and I. I I was in Los Angeles just recently visiting you, but it is nice to see you again. I feel we probably have some unfinished business to deal with. Well, um, you know, I've found that since we first struck up a friendship, we always have unfinished business. It's That's true. We haven't had a bad day since. I have a couple of props. This book. Friends yes. Friends. And uh, it was a collaboration with the inimitable Jordan Wolfson, the Los Angeles artist and friend. And it was organized by Emma Klein, the mighty Emma Klein. And it's on um, Gagosian picture books. And it's a beautiful, fun thing. And uh, because we are, you know, just on this, just, it's almost Halloween, but this is gonna be posted at Christmas. It's a great stocking stuffer. I think- it's a little gonna... big to get into a stocking, but it uh... well, depends. <laughs> On the girth of that stock, <laughs> but it's a great, for it's the, a great for, thing. It's, for the wide cab, it, it might, it might work. Um, it yeah, was, it was so fun to see you uh, read from the book and hear you read from the book, and it made me think a lot about this book, which is really why we're here to celebrate the release of this book, which is coming up in December. Well, I'm just here to see you, Rob, because it's only been five days and I just couldn't, you know, couldn't wait any longer. Well, be that as it may, and I'm grateful for that. We didn't really talk about this. Right. And uh, well, I, I've enjoyed reading it so much, but why don't you tell us what it's about in broad strokes? Well, it's about you, Rob. <laughs> I should probably back up. Rob and I were uh, we're all very old friends, and we were in a a band in the uh, in the early '90s in the East Village. And this this is a novel that is coming out in December, maybe around the time you're hearing this. And uh, it's uh, it concerns a band in the early '90s in the East Village, and the travails of a, a of a certain bassist who wakes up one day to find his his favorite bass, his lost object of desire, as Rob has put it, uh, missing along with his front man. He's, the front man is probably left to take the bass and sell it for drugs. Thus begins a, a dark quasi-comic journey through the, uh, the underworld of, uh, of New York City um, during the Dinkins era. But uh, one of the reasons that I was excited to, to talk to Rob for this conversation is because, you know, he's been sort of in, I've been in conversation with him, whether he's known it or not ever since. So it's nice to, nice to talk to you now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an incredible, unbelievable coincidence. This book is about a band in the Lower East Side in 1993. And we played in a band in the Lower East Side in 1993. Yes. <laughs> um, and I want to thank you um, first of all, for not writing a memoir. And there's so much, I mean, this is a time when, you know, so many artists of our generation are in a reflective mode. And there are some great memoirs that have come out like Dean Wareham's and Kim Gordon's, and there are other wonderful ones um, that have come out. Um, you know, I was thinking a little bit about Jay-Z's Jay Decoded, we were talking about that a little bit. Um, and I think maybe it feels like, you know, a lot of familiar 
uh, events, perhaps some familiar effects, um, but the names have been changed mostly and the situations have been changed, I think, to protect the, uh, the reader in a lot of ways. Protect the almost innocent. The almost innocent, but you've done something very special is that you kind of turned what was, you know, really, really fun and also a season in hell uh, into a caper. And I'm sort of curious about that move. And I was wondering about your process. Did you start this during COVID? Were you in a kind of retrospective mode? And how'd you, how'd you get into it? Well, it's an interesting question. To get back to the earlier point about the memoir, I never was going to write a memoir. And I was never, you know, I never felt my life was important enough to warrant a memoir. <laughs> From the at least from the musical standpoint, so you you named some titans of of, of music there who has who have written memoirs, and uh, so that that was not going to be in the cards. But the other thing that I've sort of the ship that I guess has passed me by these last uh, ten or fifteen years has been the the, the more auto fictional gesture, which uh, you know a lot of my peers and near peers have embraced. You know the from uh, Ben Lerner to Rachel Cusk to Canals Guard. And um, I'm still doing that, you know, bizarre antiquated uh, procedure where I, you know, make up the names of people and put them in, you know, imaginary situations. But, uh, or as a friend of mine said, you just, you just invent people to beat up on them. But uh <laughs> I think you're pretty merciful in this in this case. Yeah, no, I, I'm a kind and forgiving God, really, in the end. But the, I, you know, so I was. I think that I just have the ways that I approach uh, prose fiction. Um, I'm always trying to do something a little different, but uh, there are, you know, there are just sort of stances and and and, and views toward the aesthetic that I've always been interested in pursuing. And I think they they come into play in this book. I did a uh, I did start this a little bit before COVID, but um, I wrote most of it during during the lockdowns, and in a very kind of furtive way. I, I wrote it in you know in a notebook with a fountain pen, um, first draft, and uh, that felt you know it's kind of analog. Appropriately analog. Yeah, and uh, and I just was I was really interested in writing this kind of short, straight ahead book that that kind of took on different not that that ended up not being that straight ahead because it took on various guises as it went. Like you say, it's a at times it's kind of a a book about music. At times it's a you know a, almost a Scooby Doo caper. At times it's like a dark kind of. Serpico exploration, Serpico style exploration of, you know, of municipal uh, goings on in New York City. Or I might uh, even add a little bit of Miami Vice or like a New York cop show procedural. Like, um, yeah, there's, a, there's certainly a sprinkling of the vice. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of, I would say an homage to my mind at the time all of the shit that was swirling around it at the time. So whether it was, you know, continental theory or, you know, 70s cop movies or um, certain kinds of punk rock or, uh, you know, even clothing styles. It's a sort of like what I, it's sort of a, a retrospective uh, look at, at the, the, the teeming, and trivial cauldron of my consciousness during the early 90s. Well, I'm super pleased to see something so wonderful come out of that time. And, um, you know, you've, you've used the adjective dark a couple of times. And weirdly, I didn't feel like it was a terribly dark book. You know, it seemed more like um, an entry into knowledge or like a and, and Bill Dunn's rock Roman or something like these kids running around in this world that they don't fully understand and they don't fully know what they don't know. And they're sort of bravely going into the funny corners of the city. And there's this kind of 
intense entry into knowledge. And, you know, I was thinking also about how generally we don't talk with 20 to 28 year old kids and we, and we don't really talk about how bloody difficult that time in life is and um, about how intense it is to find your way. And um, in that sense, it sort of has a sweetness to it for me. Um, you know, the the dark stuff notwithstanding. And it also kind of fits to me within the context of your other books that I've also loved, like Hark or The Ask. Um, and formally, like on the le level of the sentence, you know, it's very, it's, it's you at your best. And um, I was wondering, I, because because I'm also interested in the process of actually like sitting down and writing sentences. This has such a great sound to it and it sits on the page in such a beautiful way. Um, how, do you, how do you get into that space? Um, and how, how, how does that kind of come about? There's some almost jagged, some, sometimes angular text and, and writing. Well, I, I guess I'm just always, I just wanna back up on one thing that you said, which was, uh, I think one of one of the things that kind of inspired me actually was the fact that I do talk to people in their twenties for a living. Mm -hmm. um, I talk to a lot of them all the time because I teach creative writing, and um, and I think that over the years I've I've you know always been very tuned into that how confusing that time is and how um, overwhelming a lot of the sort of ideas about what it is to be a person or an artist can be. And, um, and then I think that I, you know, I finally found a, a, a way to go back to, to examine what that was like for me in this book. Um, and in terms of, yeah, I mean, it all, it, I think it usually for me, it does kind of come down to the acoustics and the language. I mean, without it, you know, you might as well be making a film uh, it, or, or you working in some other medium. That's what that, you know, the medium uh, is the sense and the paragraph. And I, you know, I'm always attuned to the, the music of the prose. I'm always attuned to the ways that you can, you know, be moving in one direction and cutting against in another, both in terms of, you know, the, the meaning or the quote unquote content, but also just the, whatever sonic properties are in play at any given moment. Plus the associate, you know, the attendant associations that go with sound and with, you know, uh, meaning. So I, I start there. And I think I just started with uh, that first sentence, the day, the day after I decide I'm jack shit, the banished girl steals my Fender jazz bass. That sort of, that fell out of me. And then I had to ask, well, what comes next? And, you know, what comes next is always going to be a sentence that both comes out of that, that flows out of that, but also torques somehow, that somehow deforms what went before. So you get this kind of coiling uh, that that really stands in for uh, dramatic tension on the sentence level and keeps the reader going before they even really know what, what it's what the book's about or what before they've made real investment in characters and or in the story which happens later. One of the things I really respond to, and I, you know, this sort of came up in the conversation that you had with Jeff Dyer, is that there is um, a, it sounds great and it's so you and um i sort of see it as there being very little distinction between um the so-called high and the so-called low i mean it's it makes me think of everyone from you know your heroes like stanley elkin that you mentioned or um uh um barry Hanna, who both of whom were great stylists and it, you know and one thing that we were talking about in preparation for our conversation was that you, when we were playing in the band, right, it was sort of tacitly understood that writing was also, um, and perhaps even more so than the music, your main thing. And that in my case, making art was also that, but there was this kind of dichotomy uh, between those two worlds. And sometimes they would smear together and sometimes they were quite separate. Um, but was that a kind of balancing act for you back in the day? And like, how, how did you position 
um, your writing when we were really full tilt, practicing all the time and playing shows and going out and about? Well, yeah, I mean, it was all it was all kind of a swirl at times. You know, there was no high or low. All the different forms were mixing. It was, you know, Gerhard Richter sings the blues. It was William Burroughs live at the Apollo. It was uh, the fact that I, you know, I think that when we started the band, I was, uh, had this identity as, a, as someone who wanted to be a writer, wanted to write. And you had an identity as a, as a visual artist. And then we were doing this band. And I, you know, I think that you, you were sort of toggling between those desires. I was, I was in some ways, at least in the beginning, I think in flight from certain, I felt con constricting ideas about what a writer was or what I was supposed to be doing as a writer. I had sort of gone through a kind of series of, uh, transformations, um, but it was sort of, had been sort of dumped by the side of the road aesthetically by the end of them. And uh, I was very excited about by that. What? What do you mean by that? The, the, well, I think that I, I mean, I've talked about this in other places, but I, I you know, I think that I entered college with a, a very kind of, kind of conventional idea of, of, you know, what a writer was and what, what, what a novel was supposed to be. And you know, had a very postmodern education, and you know, got to experiment and try a lot of different uh, approaches, but never really found the thing that worked for me uh, up to that point. And so, um, didn't know what I wanted to write or how I wanted to write, and felt and you know thought the whole idea of a you know a, even being a writer was somehow suspect. And so, I I found refuge in this, you know, the situation where I was the lyricist and the lead screamer, but, you know, your guitar was so fucking loud that nobody could hear a thing I was saying, which I, you know, really loved. And I sort of, uh, that was, that was a draw for me to be sort of, to have the, the words erased on some level and to be reduced to the, the yowls and the cries and the screams and the whimpers um, and the and the bodily gesticulations, rather than have to rely on you know some sort of uh, word craft, and there was it was it was a respite, and um, except for you know the one the one song where the music fell away, and I got to you know speak my manifesto, blowhole, and that I always enjoyed because th that was a speech I really felt that was the only thing at that time I felt I could stand behind. Those words I truly believed. Everything else seemed uh, seemed a sham. So that that was my relation. You know, I loved I loved. You know, I did write some lyrics and, and so forth, but it was really about everything everything else besides the words that uh, excited me about the project. Well, you know, I've I always felt like my role was to provide a really a sort of sonic substrate for you. And, um, you know, one of the crucial moves that we made uh, was- a I would call it a sonic cocoon, really. Sonic cocoon. <laughs> and I, and I, I think, I'm glad you liked it. I have, uh, I uh, habitually apologize to, to Big Jimmy Fingers, our bassist, um, that we didn't get him a bigger bass rig sooner. There was uh, a lot of tension in the band over the volume of, of each of you. So I remember- well, you know, I, I apologize, Nicholas. I love you. I'm sorry. Um, I'm glad that we finally got that 500 watt base rig so that we could, you know, occupy the space that we needed to occupy uh, together. Um, and, you know, I, 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 it seemed like um, I identify with what you're saying. It, it, it was something that I always wanted to act on the body very directly, you know, to be really super, super loud. And, um, you know, when we went to get your tool belt and your 100 foot mic cord uh, or mic cable, I felt like that opened up a whole new world for us and for you because you could seamlessly sort of daringly jump through the fourth wall uh, of tyranny and go directly into the audience. And, you know, 
I've been listening to some of our recordings. I count 27 songs of which maybe 12 are comprehensible and that, you know, probably 30 other bits, but there are a lot of instrumental sections and yes. uh, what the heck were you doing out there? I mean, I that was, a, that's a lot of burden on you. I was going out and communing with the people, Rob. That's what I was doing. Well, I remember I mean, specific- because I had the, because I had the extra, Mike Cord, I could, as you say, venture all around the club and make lots of friends. Kind of messianic uh, gesturing. Yes, I mean, I wasn't necessarily trying to break fourth walls. I was trying to build them all over. A communion, but it's, you know, but you never seemed to break. There was never any kind of rupture. There was never a wink. Well, that was the rule of the band. No winking, no acknowledgement that this might be a put on um, and deadpan rigor. And I deadpan think that, uh, I think that's, that's what was uh, most important to me during those performances. I have some artifacts in the, um, in the archive that I've kind of carried with me um, for whatever reason, because I love what we did in those overstuffed songs and all the, fun things and I found this one um, and he was in many ways kind of a patron saint absolutely a total commitment to the gag and also a kind of insistence on not breaking I mean in a lot of ways in the way that the Ashton brothers were for Iggy or you know whomever lots of bands were kind of working in that vein but when I look at the pictures um and thanks to mike galinsky for taking so many pictures of us and i think without his pictures there probably wouldn't be any record of us at all uh visually anyway um and uh i just you know i, I honestly i have a couple regrets and um when, and uh do you have any regrets from that time i sure but i don't i don't know if i can articulate them it's just a, a large murky cloud of regret, perhaps. Well, I don't mean to get all heavy on you. I mean, it's yeah. just, I look really at the bumming me out, man. I look at the fit of my pants and I'm appalled, you know, I just like, they, they look, I look like Sinbad. I don't know what was going on. All of those loose. But the fitted- cut of your jib on the other hand. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, and, um, you know, let me think what else. I Other than that, I don't really have any any terrible regrets from the time and i don't really remember how we broke up or if we ever really did but was there a marker for you when you knew it was time to move on well i remember a conversation with uh that i had with our dear friend big jimmy fingers when we were and this actually is replicated to some degree in my novel but uh I remember, I think we were doing our laundry at some laundromat and he said to me, you know, I don't want to be 30 in a fucking band. (laughs) And I remember that was shocking to me because I was like, what are you talking about? I want to be 50 in a band. I want to be 80 in a band. Um, But uh, he he was all, I, I sensed, oh wait, he's actually thinking about after this. He's thinking about, you know, the next stage. And I wasn't quite there yet. But um, no, a lot of things contributed to our dissolution, which we don't have to get into here. But uh, I think there were there were many factors. But you know, a band is not supposed to be together forever, and unless and you know, unless it's some becomes a sort of you know financial uh, resource, unless it's a kind of a money making machine, they tend to break up. Um, or, or just occupy a different position and become a thing, you know, where the band just loves to do it and they get back together and yeah. Whatever. I mean, I mean I, but those some, are that's just kind of more like you know, that's fun and nostalgia. I'm talking about the the you know that initial ferment, foment. Um, I think that uh, that's it's a special thing that you know when we were starting out, we didn't know what we were doing but we had a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, sort of misconceptions that were quite productive 
and I think like we we were able to to make something really interesting for a while. And I think you know that's true of art scenes, that's true of literary magazines, it's true of you know all it's true of film collectives, whatever you know. It doesn't really matter. It's a group of people come together and at the right time and do something interesting. But that's you know, it's it's uh, dissipation is built in, I think. But it's what's beautiful is what's made in that time. Well, but, it's, uh, it's but speaking of making, I wanted to segue oh. here. Um, think, and thinking about this book, there is, and, and what you were doing during this time, you know, in the book, there's a scene where they go to an art gallery and there's a, there's a and we kind of have a foray into the, the 90s art world, which I really only kind of got glimpses of through you at the time. But I was wondering like what you thought, you know, now that you've, become you know an artist like what you were thinking about in those days and what, what art was for you and and while we were in that band and you were living in new york and you know there was a period of time when we were like playing shows but you were also in the whitney program and you were like you know trying to figure out what it all meant and whether it could all work together or whether it needed to be there needed to be a firewall between them but um but also that but also like what was art what was going on in art and how is you know what does it look like from here? Well, you know, for me, there was definitely a kind of separation uh, between, you know, the intensity and sometimes headiness of the Whitney program, where I was really, really lucky to work with Mary Kelly and Hal Foster and Benjamin Buclot and um, Ron Clark and all these wonderful artists that were visiting. And it was an incredible privilege. I was very aware of it. I kind of had a bunch of um, the sort of critical theory that we were reading that was popular at that time previously. And I was struggling with that and trying to reconcile some of the uh, idealistic feelings I was having about my own art making. And as I was sort of learning about the machinations of the art world, because I was also working for Heim Steinbach and Dara Birnbaum later and for this wonderful painter, David Diao. And I was learning, really learning the ropes from those people. And in that sense, um, the, the rock box and our practice space was an absolute refuge. And I loved leaving the studio at the Whitney program or the conversations and going and just rocking so ferociously and, you know, have, expressing feelings that you can't express, uh, you know, in a text or in a written, you know, analysis of- Or in a seminar. Yeah, right, you know, you know. Um, and reckoning with also the really intense headiness of a lot of the stuff we were reading, like, can the subaltern speak? And what does that mean for us? And are we really subaltern? No, I don't think so. Um, and then also reckoning with the kind of disconnect between that intensely um, rigorous Marxist, post-Marxist critique in that rarefied environment with students that are really getting into it and yet not feeling like we were connected to labor politics, not going to hearings, not, you know, there was some street activity, but it was just so confusing. And so in a weird way, each one was a refuge for the other. So we would practice and we would play and that we would sort of go down various rabbit holes there. And then I was always relieved to have the structure of um, that program and, and then the art world. And I guess to, in short, like I was very quietly ambitious. I was curating shows. I sort of recognized perhaps that the, the ghost of the crash show that I curated with Tom Zoomer that had so many wonderful artists in it. And I was really interested in the artists in this. And um, those folks would be, um, you know, some of our friends um, who were doing stuff around, um, I don't know, a kind of like handmade idiosyncratic systems and pushing the boundaries of painting. I was really interested in Blake Rain's work and I was really interested in Alexis Rockman's work at that time. But also, like, if we were to look at the kind of Whitney Biennial of 1993 as a as a bellwether, the work that was there that I was kind of interested in um, was, you know, um, Fred Wilson's work and Renee Green's work, which is kind of institutional critique 
and really from here. But then Mike Kelly's work was something that was just absolutely an explosion because it affected every part of your body. And it was so smart and so um, sensitive and so such a provocation. And I think that that was kind of a marker for me. You know, like in Mike's photograph on the Sonic Youth record um, and the kind of aesthetic of the pathetic and you know, you said I was always a little too interested in, or more interested in abjection than you. Um, but anyway, that kind of, that time, this cult of the handmade, I think that that's something that I was kind of interested in at the time. Um, I was really blown away by Charles Ray's nuclear family and that giant fire truck. For whatever reason, you just sort of like what you like. I loved going to Printed Matter, where oh, our yeah. friend worked. And I just, I always thought that that was just a perfect hive of ideas and handmaking and not asking for permission to do stuff. But I think, you know, in reflecting on it, you know, the, the, ed, the end of the Dinkins era and the beginning of the Giuliani era, which was just before the influx of capital around the internet, we were still kind of in that moment of ferociously, you know, guarding our amateur status. I never really thought of our band as a professional, as a, as a career per se, it always, but we always insisted on it not being art, which was a kind of crucial distinction. Um, but those are the things, but like, this is one thing that we, we were talking about last week, which is, you know, um, something that in your book is so wonderful is that there's the band's scene is so intense and it feels so epic and gigantic. And yet I think of the Jay-Z line reflecting on that time, which paraphrasing, he's basically saying, you know, New York is a thousand universes or maybe 10,000 universes all at the same time. And we're all, you know, reading the times and the post and we're eating the same food and we're drinking the same water, but we all have these intense scenes. So the kind of, one of the fun things that, that readers, I think, will enjoy the way that I did is that it's just such a microcosm. And in talking with Craig, when we were making the song for your book on tape, Craig Wedren of Shudder to Think, he was, he lived three blocks away from us. We went, we were at a lot of the same shows. We didn't even know each other existed. And I think if we did, we probably wouldn't be friends now, but that's something I'm curious about. Like, um, like the awareness of all these different scenes and they, you know, there are some, some moments when they, when they collide, but mostly it's funny because they were well, you'd adjacent. See, you know, you'd be walking down the street and you'd see these bands listed on a flyer and they're playing at the same place as you played. You, and, and, but you only knew them as these band, you know, you try wondered what the hell they might sound like. You weren't friends with them. They weren't part of your scene. And they, yeah, there were all of these different scenes stacked up on top of each other in a pretty fairly, you know, restricted uh, series of blocks. And um, but yet, as you said, one felt that one's one's project was filling up all of that space that your, you know, your band was the, you know, and I, I have a lot of, you know, riffs in the book about the, the, the sense of self-importance that that <laughs> these these kids have in, 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 in their endeavor. But, um, but yeah, it was it was a very it was a very interesting transitional time, I think uh, it was. The time, as I said the other day, it was like the time of, you know, we were the knock schleppers, like, you know, punk had come, you know, the, the glory days of CBs were long gone. Um, we were like, you know, we were actually like the beginning of like the, the douchebags on some level coming into coming into the place. But we still we still believed in the old ways. We were like the last of the old believers. Um, I think we played an, an all ages show with the douchebags at one point. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, I felt there even then, you know, there was that so much tension in that neighborhood, some class tension, gentrification tension going on. Um, so many layers of, of, of living had gone on in that neighborhood already. Um, and it was, and I, you know, I, I try to touch on all of that stuff in the book as well, but I remember feeling it very, uh, uh, very sharply when we were, when we, when we were living there and feeling like there was always that feeling of like, you know, it was the, we were dealing, you know, we were stymied by, there was so much it felt that was, that was, you know, that should and did stymie us at the time, such as, you know, 
the burden of history, the burden of rock history, you know, the, the burdens of irony, the ironies of privilege, all of it sort of just stacking up and sort of making it kind of sometimes even hard to, to make any gesture at all so that what we did had to be kind of so crazed and, um, uh, and sometimes so ridiculous just to kind of break out of those, uh, th those sort of uh, fetters. And so, you know, I, I, I really feel very, even talking about it, very, very uh, attuned to those, those questions and, and those, uh, those self-interrogations. Well, those self-interrogations and those fetters, those fetters were, you know, both, both real and imagined, right? That we, yeah, we, I mean, we, could, we, we could conjure it, um, you know, and, and I, one thing that I really... Well, I always, I always, and this goes to this day, I always envy the artists, writers that I, that, you know, I consider just dumb enough. They're, you know, not self-reflective enough to, to get in their own way. And, you know, they, they ascend to the heights and then, you know, under that are some very interesting people who, you know, trip over themselves sometimes because they're a little too aware. Or who are prey to their own rigid orthodoxies. I mean, um, you know, we, we, we joked around about the, uh, the tyranny of small differences, the, the concept that basically, you know, a, a, a driven from aggression and for the need to differentiate, there's a, another band that's just like you, but you despise them for no good reason. And I, well, you know, yeah, but you, but uh, see, this is where I think we disagree because I think there's very good reason. And I think that because I think all there is in the end, when you're an artist, all there is is taste and the creation of your taste is all there is, is all that you can really rely on. And, and the taste is made of those tiny distinctions. And from, from the outside, I understand to someone outside of it, it looks ridiculous and it's hard to tell the difference and it's silly, but when you're inside of it and, you're, and, it's, and it's incumbent upon you to make something that distinguishes itself, you, you have to rely on those kind of absurd distinctions yeah yeah and um you know there's still some bands i i'm not i just cannot like for whatever reason and i i just miss out on them and i kind of you know in this i know it's entirely irrational uh but i suppose beef is beef you know we were you know well i mean i just I, i've been asked to do this some podcasts about the 90s right because of this book and um and they said well we're gonna have a theme song that goes along with it. Here's your choice. These are like all big theme. These are songs from the nineties. And it was like 50 songs. And they said, you know, choose one to be like, and you know, 49 of them were, I thought abominations. And, you know, there were a couple that were okay, but you know, it was just like, I know I lived through this time. I know these are, you know, this is my time, the nineties, but like most of the shit of any time is horrible. So, you know, to be, to have to choose from that was, you know, was, was very difficult. What are a couple that come to mind from that time that, that sort of really, I don't know. I mean, all I, those, all sorry, the, I mean, I just think of like all those bands that sort of, you know, I guess, especially after Nirvana, like that, that kind of were kind of cookie cutter versions of, of the, you know, the soft, loud, hooky aesthetic. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. So I'm not, I'm from LA. We're yes and over here on this side of the screen. So I was actually thinking about the positive thing. Um, oh, what did I like? Yeah, what'd you like? Not the not the yes, but. So that's, that's why Los Angeles. Yes, and brother. It's yes, and brother. brother. What did you like? What are the, what three songs spring to mind from that time that were just like, oh yeah. That oh, was from that. the time or from the- 93. 92, 93, 94. From the time, there were many songs I loved, but they were not the songs that were on the radio, obviously, for the most part. They were on college radio, perhaps, but they were on other kinds of shows. But they were the songs that you and I listened to and, and, and wanted to emulate at times. You know, they were songs by bands like Laughing Hyenas and by bands like The Jesus Lizard and, you know, Urge Overkill. I mean, there were all sorts of bands and they were, they were aesthetically diverse themselves, but uh, um, they all, they all shared the uh, the same. Uh, I guess I guess they all they 
they share the attribute of not sucking. Let's put it that way. <laughs> At least. <laughs> At least. Very generous of you. Um, you know, I, I remember. Um, and don't give me your LA shit either, man. Hey, man, we're just groovy <laughs> over here. All UK9 New York brothers and sisters. Um, uh, I mean, I just, of course, you know, 100% by Sonic Youth was sort of a marker because it, it sort of broke through to the mainstream for me. And I also could love it. And they were like the big kids or something, though I never wanted to sound like them, never wanted to play like them. Um, but, uh, you know, there were folks you thought about. And um, it just sort of is like such a specific- Red place. Bliss. Oh yeah, Mike Carrera, yeah. I mean, I remember like we would go see a band like Urge Overkill or we would see Red Cross and they were so good. And so riding that edge of humor and sonic intensity and mastery that we would, you know, I always felt like it was like, oh, can't do that, gotta go this way, gotta go that way. So it was, there was a kind of met there was a, a kind of difference mapping or something that happened that way. But also, Sammy, in the in the book, critical theory, I'm very sensitive to it because I'm also teaching in a graduate program and have for the last 10 years. Um, and I'm teaching a, a course on contemporary critical theory, especially with respect to art. And critical theory has a very special place in especially the first part of, of uh, the book for Jack Shit. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit um, because it was such a thing to reckon with. And uh, I mean, there's there are a couple of passages in particular where some of the preoccupations of the 90s and that time are so sort of, sort of humorously and beautifully laid out. Yeah, I mean, I was just, I guess I was more having fun with the idea that this was a, a guy who had, you know, taken some courses in college and, and read some texts and then was trying to uh, find a way to, you know, find those coordinates in his, in, in the life he was living now and um, trying to, uh, to make it all jibe. And, uh, and, and he gets it all, he kind of mixes up terms a lot and sort of, uh, it's all, it's all a, an exciting jumble to him rather than a, any kind of systematic way of, of perceiving the world, but it certainly formed him in a lot of ways. And I think that reflects the way I, you know, I related to it as a young man and probably still relate to it. Um, but uh, it's certainly these, these are characters who are in the kind of, they're hearing a lot of theory. They've read some theory. They talk, they had to talk theory at a certain point. It it's informs some of their uh, conversations about art and and life, but uh, it's in in a way it's kind of also like uh, a design choice. It's a or or a kind of a kind of apparel for them as well. Yeah, maybe so, and and it's well, it's definitely a sharp instrument, right, or a sharp tool in the in the proverbial toolbox, and. I mean, I, I remember its great promise was that you could, if you worked hard enough at it and had the right models or tools, you could kind of basically figure out how things worked, how power worked and so on and so forth. But I definitely sort of felt at times, especially at the Whitney program, not so much with instructors um, and the beloved faculty, but with students, fellow students, I sort of felt like maybe there should be a rule that any art student that that quotes from Gramsci's prison notebooks or uses the word hegemony in casual conversations should have to do a mandatory seven-year term working in criminal justice reform on the inside, or at least suffer the dire consequences of, uh, of getting an A minus or something. It did, it did, you know, help me see the world. It was, you know, I think I went in with kind of Marxist inclinations anyway, and it, it broadened them and helped shape them. Absolutely, and it, it it gave me it gave me context. Uh, I just also saw the ways that it sort of could divide people um, and keep people from sort of more kind of a more collective kind of solidarity, a communication. That's all. It's when it's 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 like any other specialty language when it's you know used 
to describe things precisely, it's incredibly useful when it's used to, uh, to close off mm -hmm. discourse or create an elite club, then it's a problem. Yeah, and um, it sure raises holy hell in the pra practice space when you have to uh, debate the hermeneutics of mid-tempo eighth note rock and uh, the tyranny of, of the one beat, you know, with your drummer who is absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, we should and a crazy shout out to Bruce Oyster Cooley, who who was our drummer, and not only that was our at least my semiotics TA before that. So <laughs> well, you no, know, it's sort of like when you see the dynamic of the Beatles, their power dynamic was forged when they were 13, 14, 15, 16, whatever they were, and you can see it still in its you know latent form getting played out. I think Bruce was always your TA a little bit, you know, and, and until uh, well, until things sort of unraveled. So what what are what are you working on now, Rob? I see a lot of paintings behind you, but you have some shows coming up. Yes, thank you, Sam. Um, well, uh, uh, I'm working on a show uh, which will open just after this is posted uh, in January at. Fernando Mignoni's gallery at 960 Madison Avenue. And it's a show of paintings and a sculpture. Um, and um, I'm also working on a project um, in Berkeley and in San Francisco um, with a kind of philosophy and technology uh, think tank uh, called Transformations of the Human. And it's an augmented reality project. Um, and basically, uh, a lot of my work right now is working with some earth scientists who are studying uh, circulation, planetary circulation, and the, and the interaction of uh, glacial melt and ocean currents and its downstream impacts on the world's weather. Um, so paintings and sculptures and some augmented reality things and having a lot of fun kind of exploring um, the sort of strange feeling of being now. Um, as we reckon with among many reckonings that are happening now, um, you know, what it, what it feels like and what it means to make art um, and, and be in a time of, in which we have an awareness of humankind as a geological force. And so kind of thinking about it that way and, you know, in short, paintings like this one. I love it. Uh, which is um, based on a, a film still of an iceberg that I filmed with our friend David Udris up in Greenland um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'll be going back to Greenland with the National Science Foundation grant uh, this summer with any luck. Um, um, but, you know, hey, who knows what's going to happen? Um, you know, when this is up in, in six or eight weeks from now, who will have won the World Series? Where's the Dow going to be? Will, What's, is will, really will, gonna, will Putin off a dirty bomb? World, will Putin win the World Series? Yeah, will Putin. <laughs> um, but what, what the, you know, what the heck is going to happen? I'm interested in the question you know you just asked. What is it you know? What does it feel like to make art now? I have this conversation with my students all the time who feel, you know, uh, really torn about you know even the even making art at this moment. Shouldn't I be doing something else? Shouldn't I be, uh, you know, who cares? Who's going to care? What's the, what's the point? Do you have any uh, thoughts for my students? Well, one of my greatest teachers who I was so lucky to work with um, changed everything for me around this specific question. And he um, was deeply involved with moral learning and I, and I was like you know I am having a problem because my work cannot contain all of my interests and concerns and um you know I feel a certain guilt and obligation I'm making paintings and because of the economics of the painting uh economy and the way that power and money works in the art world I'm struggling with this and he said uh, essentially it's not the only thing that you do. It's one of the things that you do. And why don't you just go and volunteer and help some other people 
and make some space for that. And it was it was the simplest recommendation at the right time, and it changed everything for me. And it was a kind of moral teaching, which is that if you don't do stuff for other people for free, then you're not going to feel good at doing anything at all. And so, I mean, I hope your writer, your writing students, and my students in our critical theory and practice seminar, and all of us as artists and doers can carve out some space to do other stuff as well that actually make the world better as we would like it to be. So that's what I'm doing. And in the meantime, like I come up with these cockamamie strategies like tithing a, a portion of profits to give them to organizations that can do better work than I can, like Earth Justice or um, that. But it's, a, you know, to the extent that I have any any suggestion, it's only self-reflective. It's it's that's the kind of stuff that I'm doing. What do you think about that? I mean, well, I mean, I said basically similar stuff to my students who have brought this up. I'm one when I said like, look, if you know, if you're choosing between writing a short story and like you really can save the planet, save the planet, like that's better. But it's probably not on you alone to save the planet. So you can write the short story today. Um, the other thing is, you know, I had a student who was very, very uh, political and active. And I said, you know, in the morning, go set the police car on fire. And then in the afternoon, <laughs> yeah. you can work on your novel. You don't, it's, you don't have to choose, you can do both. And, and, and the thing is about Sam Lipsight, he means it, man, he <laughs> means it. <laughs> and suddenly there are like, Cop cars on fire all around Morningside Heights. Well, yeah, maybe that's why it's going on like that. Here. Professor Lipsight, <laughs> Professor Lipsight. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, you know, look, I, I think any way that we can get from our studios or our writing nooks out to the street, um, uh, the, the better. And that is a struggle. There's no question about it. Um, but, you know, one thing I was also thinking about, Sammy, in this book is that it it is formally uh, and from a narrative standpoint, a bit of a departure for you. And while it has a lot of that unflinching, zero winking tenaciousness that's always been in your rants, whether it's blowhole or the ask, there is a kind of sweetness to it. And there is, I facetiously said, you know, People that see this in the holiday season, you know, just after you're done watching It's a Wonderful Life, get out your copy of No One Left to come looking for you and curl up with a cup of mulled cider and, and you know, breathe it in. But there is a true sweetness to it. I mean, there's always a sweetness to your book. There's a true sweetness to it at the very end of the book. I almost felt like it was like a Tolstoyan bodice ripper or a pearl clutcher. Like I felt very, very moved by it. And it seemed like a pretty conscious choice. Um, now I'll pose that as a question. Was that a conscious choice? Or did it just sort of- How to end the book? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it's usually a conscious choice after, after a certain point. When you're staring at it for a long time, you have to sort of decide that that's going to be where it stops. Yeah, I mean, I wanted it, I wanted it to end on a sort of, I won't say, you know, a lot of a lot of bad stuff happens, but you know, there there can still be an active. I don't want to give it away, but some, you know. Well, it's a big, it's a, a big a nice feeling. It's a I mean, it's it's but thank you for your thank you for your words. You've always been a great hype man for uh for work. So I appreciate well, it. From from putting the tool belt on you on stage or putting yeah. the cape around your shoulders when you were overtaken with with feeling in the in the mode of James Brown, um, or riding your back with my guitar or whatever, but I'm a huge fan, and uh, it's, all, it's always an event in our household when one of your books comes out, and I think it's always an event for uh, for lots of your readers and kind of a thrill. So um, I love it so much, and I'm not mad at you at all. I'm in fact I'm, I'm, just, I'm pretty pissed at you for a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> well, I still love you. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, no, but uh, I, again, I am just grateful that it's not a memoir um, and that it's turned into something really super positive. Um, more well, thoughts. Glad you liked it. Um, and what about, 
is uh, two questions. One is that a is that a Travis Bean base behind you? That is a Travis Bean base behind me, as a matter of fact. And I am um, you've you've called my bluff. I staged it. I can I, tell. I staged <laughs> it. I I always have the Pendleton blanket on the couch. Yeah. I don't always have the Pendleton. I mean, I don't always have the Travis out because it was Kurt's Travis Bean. Yeah. And we had to have a Travis Bean if we were going to rock really hard. And he played it on the Six Finger Satellite record and he helped kind of reinvent rock a little bit. This is Kurt Neiman we're talking about. Our the dear lot who, who died much too young. Yeah, um, who, was a, who was a crazy genius and um, a wonderful person and, and in his own way um, really was a participant in the kind of... Uh, um, transformation from post rock and indie rock um, to, I mean, it's sort of a, that Pigeon is the most popular bird record, is a real bridge to LCD sound system and to a whole genre of music that emerged out of that record, I think. That's right. We can debate that, rock historians, but I think that that's absolutely true. Um, and I think James Murphy would probably agree with James that. Murphy, who, uh, you know, I was excited to give the book because he was around hanging out with us during all of that this time as well. We didn't really get into that, but- um, I noticed Sam- That's, that's for another about. day. He did but, blurb it though, yeah. May I, may I read his blurb? Sure. Okay. Quote, I love this book so much. It's a hate love letter to a bad time, but it's our bad time. Yeah, it is, it was. So my the second question is, when is Black Friday going to uh, open? That dear brother could take a little bit of time. It's going to be some organization, but it will be a, a, a this large- This is a giant show that is sort of the bearing of Rob's soul once and for all. And I'm waiting for it because the, some of the pieces I've seen from it will destroy you. It's a long, and, and may they not destroy me, <laughs> um, but it's it will be a large uh, interactive show, uh, interdisciplinary show, at a defunct strip mall um, in southeastern Massachusetts uh, in the next four to five years from now, hopefully sooner. I can't wait. And there will be uh, work by uh, a number of artists that you know and some you don't know but need to know. And hopefully you'll participate on some level as we um, examine the tortured Puritan soul. <laughs> we colonize that motherfucker. D and re. <laughs> D and re. <laughs> because what is there but re after D? Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in a higher and higher velocity. Also, one, one thing, Sam, I also wanted to remind you of this. You have a lot of props today. You're like, you, you've gone all Gallagher on me. Yeah, there you go. I'm going <laughs> to chainsaw the, uh, the, uh, the, the watermelon next. Um, but in it, there is a story called The Spores, which I believe might have been one of your earliest um, published stories. And whatever you- Based on a real drug-induced psychosis I experienced. <laughs> yes. The Spores by Sam Lipside. And if any of you readers must have a copy of this, email me and I'll, I have a bunch of them. Um, I can arrange that. Um, but you insist that you had a lot to learn and you had a crisis of whatever identity um, around being an author and what that meant. But my only recollection, even from when we were in college, is that you came into the world relatively fully formed, more than most of us. And whether your early readings of Venus Drive back in college or all the stuff that went on, it was very, very clear to all of us that loved you that um, where you were going. And um, the spores was definitely, you know, again, a kind of, it's more, more of a, a less, a less symptomatic reading of the time, more of an expression of, you know, like, you didn't have as much distance on it, but it's a, it's a pretty great thing. Um, well, that again, was, I, I remember that whole crash show quite fondly. Um, it was a thread waxing space and, um, you were, you were doing some really interesting things as, as an artist and a curator in that moment. And, you know, I just, I hope that, you know, 
I mean, we, we, we had our scene and I just hope people, you know, continue to, uh, and maybe they're not gonna be able to do it in New York City anymore, but that they can do things like it all over. And that those, you know, someone said to me, someone who read the, the book I, that we were just discussing that I wrote, is said, you know, it was about, you know, when it was possible to be an artist in New York and to, to, try, to try and fail, really to try and fail without, you know, without destroying yourself, although we came close. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's more and more difficult and I see more and more pressure on younger artists and younger writers um, to get big right out of it and not play and figure things out and mess up and do, do kind of make dumb work before they make smart work and so forth. And, you know, it's just, I feel like there's just less margin for that kind of youthful error that I think is so important to the to artists and the arts. And so I hope there are other places and spaces where that can be cultivated. Well, I'm sure there are, right? Yeah. And it's it's something about human nature and creative people, but the the oppressiveness of of uh, the economy, I think it's a real thing. Yeah, and no, it is a real thing. Right. I mean, it's really changed. I mean. Again, this is a whole different conversation, but the, the you know the economics have changed drastically for young people and and you know old people like us and art you know just artists in general and like that whole that formula of you know twenty percent of artists used to kind of get eighty percent of the of the income from arts versus the now it's you know the one or two percent of artists getting eighty percent. It's just a, it's a different economy and um, it's brutal for you know both, you know, all kinds of diversity, racial diversity and aesthetic diversity and economic diversity. So it's just something that we well, have to all battle. I take, I take great um, hope from the students that I get to work with from whom I learned so much and they're geographically dispersed. They're from all different yeah. walks of life and they're not necessarily beholden to the sort of centralized markets of New York and Los Angeles and whatever in terms That's of good. art practices and they're doing stuff together and they're using, um, you know, social media to, to communicate with each other and to publicize it. And there's lots of really cool stuff happening in regional pockets where it's possible to have a little bit of free time and space to kind of figure it out. And it seems like there's a little bit of air letting being let, let out of the economy right now, maybe. Um, and that always seems to be a thing that, I don't know. I mean, we can't forget that in 1993, we were in the midst of a deep recession. Yeah, we, 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 I mean, that's a big part of the story is we were graduated into a recession and started our young and, and lives that, under that I, cloud. I mean, I remember like a very clear marker at the risk of going talking too long here, but um, I remember a very clear marker being when, you know, Nicholas came back from having seen a focus group and suddenly all the heroes of all the kids that they were polling all the time were totally different. And it went from being, you know, transgressive figures or people that were anti everything or amateurs uh, to people that were pro, like suddenly Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were people's heroes. And I think it was exactly coincidental with the influx of capital into the internet, which is a radically different kind of thing. And remember when everyone got jobs and suddenly you were working at Feed with Stephen Johnson and then I was even working at, with you guys um, and everyone sort of was working their way up. But I remember like when we first got to New York, if, if a, an art student or a writer got an internship with the New Yorker or got a Penn fellowship or worked for Penn or um, got an internship with Charlie Rose. It was a big deal. It just, there wasn't that, it felt like there wasn't that much opportunity. And hence we had a lot of time to kind of, and it was, and it was also bloody and expensive. You could, when I think about all the things we did, how full our lives were and how relatively free, go, free easy, easy going it was, it's kind of amazing. Um, Dollar fifty for two slices and a soda, right. or pierogies at Odessa. Anyway, 
various places. So is there other stuff that we um, didn't hit? I mean, of course there is. Yeah, probably. But we'll have to uh, reconvene, I think, at another time because I don't want to bore people too much with this. I know, a lot of blah, blah, blah. Um, but I love the book so much and congratulations. And again, you, and congratulations on your upcoming shows. I, paintings look fantastic. Um, it's, a, it's a start. I mean, it's, 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 it's unknown, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I can pull it off that, you know, by the time this is up, the work will be done. It'll be shipped. It'll be in transit. We'll be sitting by the fire and reading Friend of the Pod and, and uh, no one right, left. I'm okay. looking for you. <laughs> And Sounds like a plan. 